First time I've ever done a presentation from the memory, so I find it's working. Anyway, so I'm doing a talk on ARM virtualization. I'm going to cover basically how it works, and then I'm going to cover the door of support for it. And I'm going to try to make this fast because I already 25 after. I'm going to probably skip over some stuff. So, ARM virtualization was introduced with the ARM v7. Uh, the Cortex A15 is the first impl implementation of ARM v7 that actually supports it. Um, Chips such as the OMAP5 and the Samsung Exynos 5. Uh, also introduced with this was a new hypervisor mode, which is basically a mode underneath, if you will, your standard guest or your standard um, privilege mode for your kernel, and then which is in turn underneath user mode. Um, the way it's done right now, you have to enter hypervisor mode with the bootloader. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they decided to do that. It's it's actually kind of annoying. It's not so easy to just once you enter hypervisor mode, you can then exit and leave it via syscalls. But if you don't boot into it, then you can't enter it again after the fact, which is a problem with say the like Chromebook, and that if since the bootloader doesn't support hypervisor mode, I can't just run hardware vert on it without booting the or porting the bootloader. Uh, basically, when you're running in hypervisor mode, you have your um, you have your host kernel if you're using KVM or if you're using the uh, uh, you have the hypervisor running in hypervisor mode. And then on top of that, you have guest OSs. And they run in the same privilege space as a normal kernel would without any sort of virtualization going on. So it, they see the hardware as if they weren't virtualized at that point. Uh, it has a hard dependency on LPA and large physical address space. And I'll get into that in a bit. So, in hypervisor mode, as I said, they, the kernels see it as if there, there was no virtualization present. It's they're running in the same privilege mode. Um, as if y'all attended John Masters' talk yesterday, he was talking about, talking about privilege mode that ARM has. Uh, you have pure blue mode, which is for bank processing and stuff like that. And then you have mode, you have your kernel mode, and you have user mode, basically. Um, but the hypervisor mode is a new mode between the security level order and the normal kernel mode. It's a highly privileged mode, and you can it allows traps for system calls and such like right for right from the guests. Um, I'm trying to. Right here. So you can in the in the hardware you have a then you have trap for system calls available. And as same thing as with x86 virtualization. You have um there's a re instruction ERS that lets you return from hypervisor mode. So you can enter and leave as well once you've booted into it. Uh, you have true state address translation, and basically same thing as virtualization on x86. And once again, I'll get to that in a bit. And it depends on LPA for that translation. It gives you LPA large physical address extension gives you 40 bits available for address, so you can you can actually address up to one terabyte. 
Um, and it also provides under virtualization, you also have the same 40 bits available for each guest OS. And uh, it has the two stage translation, so it gives you the ability to translate between the two. So each guest OS has its own 40 bit address book. Uh, within, within each stage, you have three translation tables. Uh, you have well, three translation levels. And level one has a tra has translation tables for user space and kernel. And you can actually decide what, you can actually map out how much you, memory user space gets, how much memory the kernel gets at, at this level one. Level two, you know, level two basically, points to a larger chunk of memory, and then level three points to a larger chunk. Uh, with virtualization on top of that, you have there's, there's three stages, or there's three levels of translation in stage one. And that's what, in stage one is for your guest OS. Basically, it translates from virtual memory to an intermediate physical address. And using this, those three levels of translation I was just speaking of, and then stage two on your host OS, your hypervisor, same thing. It gives you those three levels of translation, but and then each kernel, each guest kernel running, basically gets a chunk of that space there. And the the stage two translates from the intermediate physical address to the actual physical address. And that's done by hardware, but it's assisted by your hypervisor. The generic interrupt or generic interrupt controller and the generic timers are have been modified with ARMv7 to give you extensions to support virtualization. They give you allow traffic for hardware calls from your guest OSs. Uh, the generic timer gives you can be set for each guest to let off. So it sees it as its own timer as if it was running the actual hardware. Um, then support I believe did Zen support LAN in 3.h? Anyway, I believe Zen support LAN in 3.h for ARM and KVM 3.9. Uh, then in a lot of ways, the way Zen works on ARM is it has a hypervisor that runs in hype mode, and that's it. And then your the the main your virtual machine managing OS, the OS you're using to manage your virtual machines, actually is in a special domain within Zen, domain zero, and that's where you're running your host OS. And it's actually in Zen, it's actually run as a guest, but it's a very privileged guest. And then you have your other guests that are run at the same execution level. And with KVM, the kernel itself is the hypervisor, and it runs in hype mode with your with the, with its own guest OS. And then your get your then your um, guests are run on top of that. So in a lot of ways, this really I think that Zen is actually the better. Fit for ARM for this reason because it's, it's running just a hypervisor in hard mode, and that's it. Is it you have to run the entire host kernel in to run that with hypervisor mode with KVM? Yes. Uh, okay. And that's the way KVM works because the kernel itself is the hypervisor. Yeah. Um, as of TMU 3.5, it supports ARM, and if you're running, I think you probably need one. Yeah. Yeah, I think you just said the wrong number. It's 1.5. Yeah, 1.5. Yeah, the latest release of TMU as right. of what? May, I believe. Yep. And it's available in Pro 19, by the way. <laughs> um, so, right now, the problem with supporting 
virtualization in Fedora is largely lack of hardware at this point. As the two readily available SPIFs are like the OMAP wipe and the Exynos wipe. And the Chromebook, the Samsung Chromebook has the Exynos wipe, but Google's firmware is a pain in the rear to get around. And it, there's some people that say that it, they have managed to run virtualization on the Chromebook. But none of them have actually been able to give step by step files to reproduce it, so I'm not quite sure I believe them. Well, there, there is a, the, the guys, like someone just posted something in the past week. There's like a PDF that goes over the system calendar. Yeah, I, yeah. I read through it and I tried to reproduce the results and I could not. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't know if anyone has read that or done so. I know Dan Berench wrote something. Uh, well, he wrote about how to just get Fedora on the Chromebook. Chrome. Ah, yes, sir. Um, so, but yeah, no, no. apparently the, there's instructions or some, or a Red Hat guy tried them, but he did it with Ubuntu. So, uh, yeah, I have um, last look. Now, uh, some some other. I just got an email like two days ago. Oh, uh, okay. Saying, oh yeah, you got to work with Ubuntu. You should the, get that to work. The Zen guys have a Git repo mm -hmm. and a bunch of information. And once again, I tried to follow their their instructions. And have not been able to get actual hardware work working, even with Zen. Um, and I, I believe it's not so much the it's not so much the ARM chip that is the problem. It's Google's firmware on the Chromebook. The ARM fail board, which has the same sock, actually runs very flawlessly. Um, I'm not sure how many OMAP five devices do work because I haven't the I haven't even seen one in person. I know they're out there, but most of the people I know that have been running Burke on ARM have been doing with the ARM Dell board, which is the Xenos 5. Um, and it's a, just a regular development board. It's got all the development peripherals that you'd expect. And basic, like 4 gigs of RAM, I remember. It's a pretty decent little board. It's fairly inexpensive, too. So. If you want to give it a shot, I, Armdale board is probably your best bet. The current Fedora kernel, uh, the one of the kernel ARM kernels boots on it, you have to have LPAE and BERT enabled before we have a kernel built that will run on it and give you BERT. So you can actually run Fedora on, a, on an ARM device and have hardware BERT. It's just you can't do it with the Chromebook, at least as of now. So. Other than that, Fedora support for Merkle and ARM is not that great, just because of again, lack of hardware. So, any questions? I was trying to run through it fast because of time. So that's the kernel hypervisor model supports virtualization. Um, but that's common kind of. What about BERT with BERT, BERT IO, all the kind of higher level? I mean, I don't mind Lib. sitting there and typing Q and U, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so so I work for ARM is apparently coming in with BERT. It's not there yet. Okay. Yeah, I've I, I, I been the one working on it. PCS yeah. poster set up. It's, it, it's like, you know, nine, nine, it doesn't see much change. I mean, it's not working on it. So BERT IO is support on ARM. Yeah, uh, you can run KVM on an ARM Dell board with Q and U, and you just have to actually Manually type out the gazillion right. lines uh, for the run QMU to. Right. And just because KVM support doesn't mean that BirdIO automatically got supported, but my understanding is that BirdIO has actually been, up, has been working longer than KVM. You know, the, yeah. the KVM support has been there, mm -hmm. um, so at least since I think pre updates kernel. The QMU support for that just went into, it's, a, it's not released yet, but it, 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 it'll be in QB1 update probably coming out like Monday or Tuesday. Um, and all guests are going to be using the virtual bus model to some extent? Uh, that's the intent, yes. Well, if you're, yeah, I mean, it, just, it doesn't have to. Uh, I mean, right now, the only the machine types that are in the QMU that support it are the Express A9 and B9. 
press release for the team. And it's a little hacky the way they get it to work. But I think long term they're part thinking of doing this between you and like facilitate creating KVM on virtual machines. Or they're adding a new machine type which doesn't map to a real board in real life. So what it will do is as you pass a device on the command line, it'll dynamically generate the device tree and pass it to the kernel. So you're not tied to emulating a real board where if you wanted to add a second video card or something like that, or you know, whatever, you couldn't do it because the kernel doesn't expect that because that hardware doesn't exist in real life. Um, so you're just going to arbitrarily, arbitrarily pull together the IRQ that's yeah, and the kernel support literally. And, and the, the, the cards understand the kernel support for it, aren't they? So that it's not. That would make sense to me, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't know too much about the low-level details in that respect, but um, that seems the way the way it's going. You know, that just makes sense, more sense for virtual machines anyway, especially because you know if you have a board that the most in real life has ever supported it, like a gig of memory, but at some point you want to be able to create an ARM again that has four gigs of memory. Or something like that, you know, in some random future. Um, and you can just run generic generic ARM kernel on it. Right. Well, of course, but that's always building kernels now with multi device ports anyway, so yeah. We have a pretty generic kernel to begin with. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what if you need some sort of critical kernel build or anything like that at the moment. Um, I mean, it's like I said, the, the QMU well, package. Well, you do for the host kernel. Right, right, right. The, the QMU package for that kind of building the machine dynamically thing has just been public but so they're probably not going to be available for a few months as an actual release. Could even be longer, but uh, I think that's the way they're going. But as far as the actual Libvirt and you know Vert Manager by extension you know, higher level tools, it should be like fair, fairly straightforward. As opposed to past it, it fixed some of the issues. But it's really just minor stuff. You know, we've already got all the functions to do it. It's just someone Actually, testing with ARM and then fixing a couple corner cases where there's bad stuff in it. So it's kind of a grab for the part. Are there any plans to produce uh, a virtual like driver support for uh, Linux on ARM to possibly potentially improve uh, driver performance? I know that there's some hacks you can do that if you know that you're running a virtual, if you know that you're running as a guest, uh, I don't know, there was stuff. some talk on. On the K or KVM chunk of LKML mm -hmm. about doing that, yeah, but it's that was a few months ago. I don't know where that went. Okay. Well, um, it, I mean, isn't that for Rails, right? Yes. So that I mean that already exists. So if you're talking okay. about altering an existing driver for a real physical device, then mm -hmm. that's probably not even the way they want to go because if they're going down this route of uh, building up a machine dynamically. That doesn't represent real hardware, then presumably what people would 99% of the time be giving it is saying, okay, create a bird IO thing or a bird IO disk or something like that. Okay. So that's the plumbing for that already exists. Um, and even in QMU, you can support bird IO with, like I said, DXpress 8.9 or whatever. And so even though those represent physical boards and they obviously don't have, you know, bird IO hardware because there doesn't seem such thing as physical virtual hardware. Right. They have it's basically kind of like a hack where um, you have you pass a device tree and then you know, they have they have this they know what the device tree is for a physical D express A9. But you pass it a device tree and then it dynamically alters it and it inserts it to the Bird IO stuff. So it's kind of just a stop gap so people can start testing the Bird IO and get a little bit better performance for the full proper kind of building machine dynamically thing. So it seems like things are moving pretty fast. So. There, there's if you look at the kernel, the KVM side of LKML, right lately, over half the patches have been ARM related. Peter Nader. Right. Peter, I don't remember the last name, but yeah. So Peter, Peter Nader uh, from Linaro. Yeah, well, he does the QMU side. Yeah. Um, Mark is like. I mean, that stuff's already in Android, I think. Yeah, most, most of what's 
in going on the KPM on ARM now, as far as 32 bit is bug fixes and stuff like that. Little fixes, you know, adding little things that didn't get initially pushed in, that sort of thing. Now there's a lot of work going on into 64 bit version right now, but of course we don't have any hardware that we can really play with unless you've got what, 20 grand and then that work for a company that can sign an NDA, so that's kind of out of most people's leagues. Um, so really, the basic principles of Merge on ARM are the, essentially the same. There's some oddities like having to boot into hypervisor mode that you have to watch out for. Um, the two-stage address translation that happens with any other virtualization system out there, out there, but so. Well, I'll ask the stupid question. Stupid question. Other than needing to needing to explicitly boot with the in the virtualization mode, how does how does the hardware implementation really differ from like the MX? Um, it's very short. That's that's this. I well, I, I work I work at a much higher level than this, so I'm just curious. So. I kind of glossed over that. Um, it's dependent on the LPAE, large physical address extension, and uses the, a lot of the same hardware to do the LPAE, but also do your virtualization translations. Um, system call track to your hypervisor, obviously, and the hardware. Trying to think how to. I, as someone who has worked a bit on both x86 <coughs> and um, ARM virtualization, the thing that gets me the most about what's different is in x86, you have, um, I forget what DMX calls it, AMD, AMD calls it virtual machine control block. But you have a, you set aside a chunk of memory, you fill it with all the registers for the guest, mm -hmm. and you make an explicit instruction call to start the VM and you pass it the a pointer to the beginning of that control block and then that control block gets loaded into uh, the register space and transition goes to the guest. And um, ARM you're using the actual registers in the well in ARM the way you enter uh, the hypervisor is you fill your stack with, or not you enter the hypervisor, you enter the hypervisor, the hypervisor. The way that you enter a guest is you fill your stack with the registers for the guest, and then you do an exception to come in. Oh. Right? So it's the same way that, that you start that you start scheduling uh, uh, in, a, in a normal processor. You, you suddenly, you're going along and you suddenly say, oh, now we would like to IRA. You weren't in an interrupt person. Interrupt to start with, but because you did uh, an interrupt return, you have to look at your privilege level. You're now in the kernel space, and the kernel can start doing stuff. Or you de-escalate, and you go and de-use your stuff that way. Well, you know, and then to return, you have that e-rep. Right. That's right. it's, it's, it's analogous. Um, and so that's from a programming perspective, it's a it's a more familiar conception, right? You're just moving through privilege levels up and down. So that's easy. It's, it's very straightforward in that respect. But the implementations. Well, so the thing that kind of hacky, uh, I want to call it kind of hacky, um, there are performance opportunities you could do in the x86 solution where you could cache the entire virtual machine control block. Because uh, it's, it's a data structure and memory, you can cache that. And then, if you did a, if you took a track into the hypervisor, and you didn't alter the guest state in the hypervisor, and then you went back to that same guest, you can dramatically speed up your world transitions, your world switch transition time, by just reloading that cache state. And that's something that the latest uh, Intel and AMD processors support. It. And I don't really see a very easy way in ARM 
to do that. To cache your that's your one thing I noticed. It does a huge number of translations from from different states. Yeah. Uh, for every interrupt, it say your guest OS interrupt. It it then interrupts your host virtual machine. So your host dev or your say the end of your dev KD and you're you're interrupting your host OS. Which then interrupts hardware. Within that actually does the interrupt, and then it goes back again. And there's something like for each state you have something like six translations for that interrupt, and it's very involved. There's there's a lot of conflicts with some with time expensive conflicts that can take an interrupt, which always happens. Interrupt, but but because you can't easily store the guests as an abstract cacheable object. Uh, I don't know if they're Yeah, they you can do I well I, I don't know, people are smart. Someone much smarter than me might figure something out, but um, I don't see As of right now, it's basically it gets dumped back into RAM. And then and so um, the well and then the other thing they don't have uh, I th however the situation on ARMv8. Uh, this is somewhat better. No, this is I, I talked to V8. I talked. Uh, this is from a V8 class. Which, in most of my understanding, works with the form of V8 model, and so this is where that came up. Well, it's um, worse than V7. Oh, that's a great job. Yeah. Um, the the other thing that they still need to add is uh, direct routing of interrupts to guests, which is a six. Or a five feature. I mean, they know they need to do it. They just haven't gotten through all these little logic fixes. Yeah, it's that's right now. It's the Dr. Advisor are just handling that, and basically, it's making calls to the generic interrupt controller, and, and the generic interrupt controller is virtualized so within the hypervisor to an extent, and it's a it's being translated from the Kind of virtual GIC to the actual one by the guest OS. Like I said, there's about six stages of translation to go from interrupting your guest to process and then back to your guest. Mm -hmm. It's a rather sad state of affairs. But the flip side of that is, is ARM processors take so use so much less power that you know, you trade basically you trade performance or how much power your data center uses. Anything else? Alrighty then. Please. Thank you. Thank you.